Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So today we're very happy to have Claudio Orlandi visiting us for, from Aarhus University in Denmark, and he's going to talk about some recent results on multi-party computation. Thank you, Melissa, for the introduction. So, yeah, as Melissa said, I'm going to tell you something about multi-party computation for the dishonest majority, and we're going to show how to get from passive to active security at low cost. And this is a joint work with Ivan Damgard and Jesper Nielsen that are my advisor in OUS. So. If you play poker online, nowadays what you do is that you are sitting at, at home with a, another bunch of people sitting at their home and uh, you're all connecting to a central server that uh, shuffles a deck and gives you your hand and then you can play poker uh, online. What happens is that you're putting the trust into this central server, so what happens if for some reason the server is uh, corrupted and is colluding with some of the player? Surely the server might uh, pick your hands at random but then he might pick the hand of uh, his friend in a uh, corrupted way and then give him a good hand and then he's going to steal your money. So multi-party computation, secure multi-party computation is uh, the area of cryptography that tries to solve these kind of problems where instead of putting trust in, in, into a central server, into a um, centralized entity, what we do is basically we emulate this trusted computer by putting a small piece of software or hopefully a small piece of software at, uh, remotely at each of the parties' uh, computer, and those pieces of soft software are going to compute something that uh, hopefully is going to be uh, do the same as this uh, trusted central entity. In such a way that everyone will get a fair hand, and then the game is going to be fun. So what I'm going to tell you is, uh, first of all, I'm going to tell you what secure multi-party computation is about and uh, which model of security we are going to consider. Then I'm going to tell you something about the related work in the last 20 years, and, uh, and then I'm going to describe our solution that uh, is basically computing on shared commitments, and then I'm going to tell you how to do this in a secure way, and then I'm going to give you some uh, sketch of the security analysis, please. In the special case of poker, you don't even need the same answer, you just need the same probability distribution as an honest... Uh, <coughs> yeah, yeah. Um, was just, yeah, was just an example. So other examples of uh, multi-party computation that are uh, actually uh, used in real life are electronic auctions. That's something we have been looking at. Uh, especially in Denmark, we had this uh, uh, electronic auction for a sugar beet price. Uh, and in that case, also the, the output uh, needed to be correct because the output was actually the price uh, at which you would exchange these sugar beets. It's actually funny that the first, that was the first application of multi-party computation in real life and it had to do with agriculture. So we are going back to the basics. <laughs> All right, uh, so what do I mean when I say that I want to have secure multi-party computation? What do I mean by, se by secure? So first of all, uh, correctness. We would like the output of the computation to be correct. So for instance, the poker cards are random. And then we also want privacy. So we don't want any information about your input uh, to be leaked. So in this case, you don't, I don't want you to know what my hand is, otherwise poker is not fun. But there are also other security requirements. For instance, if you're playing poker, you can imagine that someone is playing on two tables at the same time, and you don't want them to get cards from one table and play them on the other table, right? So instead of listing a, a series of requirements, of security requirements, what uh, the cryptographic community has been doing in the last 20 years is to have this ideal world, real world uh, security definition, kind of. So we first we define an ideal world where we have a trusted entity that we actually trust that is programmed to run some computation on parties' input, then the parties will just deliver their input to the central entity that will uh, compute the output of the function and just deliver it uh, to each parties. And in this setting, if one of the parties is corrupted and tries to do something that is not supposed to do, uh, well, the central entity is trusted, so it's just going to say that guy is trying to cheat and we'll just kick him out of the computation or something like that. So, in this scenario, security is, uh, is achieved by definition. 
And then we have the real world where instead of having the central entity, we are running this multi-party uh, protocol where the parties are exchanging some uh, encrypted garbage messages. And then we want this protocol to be secure as the ideal world. So we say that the protocol is secure if uh, intuitively the real world behaves like the ideal world. That means that uh, it's been formalized by saying that the adversary uh, cannot distinguish in which world it is. So if the adversary, uh, whatever attack the adversary can do in the real world, he can also do in the ideal world, then the real world is secure because there is no attack he can do in the ideal world. And we want this property to be satisfied no matter how weirdly the adversary behaves. So um, we want to be sure that the security holds, that the adversary might uh, deviate from the protocol as much as he likes. So to define this, we have to introduce uh, a new party that is called the simulator. And the simulator is kind of a bridge between the, the real world and the idle world. So the simulator is going to interact with the idle world. This is a mental experiment to prove the security of the protocol. We are going to introduce this new party it's called the simulator that we, con that we the protocol designer, uh, controls that is going to interact with the idle world and see the input-output uh, behavior of the idle world. And we'll try to uh, run the protocol with this adversary here. And uh, he has to make the adversary believes that uh, is actually playing this game. So the way to def define security is that we get the adversary, we let him play with the real game, where he's interacting with other parties, and we let him play, uh, or we let him play the idle game, where there is a simulator and inter is interacting with the idle world through the simulator. So we flip a bit, and either we put the adversary in this situation or in this situation. We let him run as much as he wants, and then we ask him, where are you playing? And if the adversary cannot distinguish between these two words, then we say that the protocol is secure. So actually, in this slide, there is just one adversary. But what we want, to, what really, what we really want here is that to have security when uh, actually all but one parties are corrupted. So, and this is particularly interesting in the case, for instance, of two party computation. So if we are in two, clearly, um, as soon as one party is corrupted, everyone but two is corrupted. And also in the case of multi-party uh, computation. It turns out that we have to pay some price uh, in order to get uh, multi-party computation secure against a dishonest majority. So given that we are uh, focusing on the case of general functionality, so we want to provide a protocol that computes any uh, functionality, we cannot guarantee either termination or fairness. Where by termination, I mean that uh, the, other, the, the adversary can just run away from the protocol, and then the protocol is not going to finish. And by fairness, I mean that uh, the adversary might choose to learn his input. And then after he sees his input, he can choose whether you are going to see your input or not. So the adversary learns his, his, sorry, his output. The adversary learns his output, and then he can run away. Um, this is it's impossible to, fairness is clearly a nice property that one would like to achieve for multi-party computation. Unfortunately, it's impossible uh, to achieve it for general functionalities. There has been some recent work by um, Dov Gordon and John Katz and other people about a special class of functionalities where you actually can, that you actually can compute with uh, fairness. But that's outside the scope of this talk. So we have been working for, or people have been working on multi-party computation for uh, more than 20 years now, or? Uh, no, yeah. Uh, starting by Yao in 82, and the protocol by GNW in 87, uh, Goldwasser, Michali, and Wigerson. The, those are feasibility results. So the, here, the problem of two-party and, uh, and, and multi-party computation have been defined and solved for the case of uh, computational security in standalone. And those solutions are secure against a dishonest majority. Um, standalone meaning that the, the protocol here is guaranteed to be secure just if you run one instance of the protocol at the time. So for instance, if you play two table of poker at the same time, there might be some problem. Then there has been some work on uh, information theoretic security uh, later on. And in order to get uh, uh, this kind of uh, security, so here the security holds just if the adversary is uh, uh, computationally limited. Here the security holds uh, no matter how, how, power, how powerful the adversary is. But here you need to assume that there is an honest majority. So clearly those solutions are not interesting for the case of two-party computation, for instance. 
And then, after more recently, the definition of uh, UC security has been introduced, and this is the definition of security we are going to go for, where UC means universally composable. Um, and in UC security, we have a st very strong security guarantee that says that uh, no matter how many protocols are running parallel over the network, and uh, so this is part especially useful over the internet, where you don't know while I'm running a protocol with you, I don't know whether you're running other protocols or maybe I'm running other protocols. And we want the security. So if a protocol is secure in the UC sense, then its security will uh, uh, keep being satisfied no matter how many protocols are running at the same time. Um, and this, solution, this was the first feasibility result for UC security and against a dishonest majority. But the use of uh, generic zero-knowledge proofs makes this protocol just uh, a yes answer. So we can do MPC, but it doesn't actually give you a way of uh, going down and implementing it. On the line of efficient uh, multi-party computation protocols, securing the UC framework against a dishonest majority and with some kind of efficiency, uh, there's been some work by Kramer, uh, Damgaard, and Nielsen in 2002-2003, uh, where you can compute any arithmetic circuits, uh, but uh, yet the solution is based on a threshold, homo threshold homomorphic encryption. In particular, meaning uh, Pallier uh, encryption scheme and this kind of scheme. And here, the, the setup assumption is that at the beginning of the time, there is someone that, gives, uh, that generates a public key and then gives uh, shares of the secret key to all the par participants of the protocol. Unfortunately, there isn't really any uh, good, efficient way uh, so far to, to generate this uh, shared setup without uh, going to a trusted party. So generating a Pallier public key and, and with the shares, it's, uh, it's still something that requires some heavy machinery. And then there has been some work by Lindel Pinkas, uh, Ishai, uh, Manoj, and uh, Amit Sai, and by myself and Nielsen on uh, efficient multi-party computation for Boolean circuits. So those are like, uh, so the first solution here was Yao in Nati Tissue, and those solutions are all um, about how to get uh, Yao, cir Yao garbage circuits to work in the UC framework against uh, active adversaries and uh, in an efficient way. While in this paper that I'm going to present now, and then uh, this work by uh, the same authors here in, that appeared at TCC this year, last year, uh, a solution for arithmetic circuits has been uh, proposed. Uh, the, efficiency, the way that our work uh, compares to this one is um, uh, asymptotically we, we have the same uh, complexity, but our constants uh, are smaller, while, while they get uh, the result on more general assumptions. And then there's been some work in try actually trying to go and get these protocols and implementing them. So probably the first one was Fair, fair Play by uh, the team in Haifa with uh, Benny Pincus and his team. And that they have uh, this, I believe you can do download it from their website. And they have solution for Boolean circuits for two party and n parties with passive security. Then Lindel Pincus and Nigel Smart uh, at this, uh, they implemented this uh, this paper uh, that appeared at Eurocrypt 2007, where you can get uh, two-party computation against active adversaries. And then in the world of arithmetic uh, uh, circuits, uh, the first problem has been uh, VIF uh, in Aarhus. With the first solution, it was for n-party computation, first against passive adversary, then against active adversary, but still uh, requiring a honest majority. And now we're implementing uh, what I'm going to present to you. So that brings the, the, that fills the gap between honest majority and dishonest, ma dishonest majority. And there is also another group uh, in Estonia, in Tartu, that they have this other framework called ShareMind, uh, where they have some similar results to what uh, we are doing. So the comparison between arithmetic and Boolean uh, multi-party computation is uh, not totally clear, because when you have uh, computing arithmetic, if you compute arithmetic circuits, uh, additions are easy, multiplication are easy. But then other operations like, uh, for instance, comparisons uh, are harder to, are less efficient to, to, to be performed. While Boolean circuits are really good at compare values or doing, doing equality, and I mean, any Boolean circuits, but then it's, they are less efficient when it comes to addition or, multipl or multiplications. 
So there is a trade-off here, and which solution you, you, you get, actually, which solution you use should be thought, I mean, application, depending on the application you're actually interested in. We're actually also working together with the, uh, the fair play people in order to try to merge the two solutions and maybe jump from arithmetic to Boolean and do everything in the domain where it's more efficient. Okay, so let me start with describing our solution. So first of all, let's assume that there is mm, a public key for a Pedersen commitment scheme that is available to all parties. This is just a random string, so uh, we assume that, this is, is in, that we have this public key in the sky. It comes from the sky. No one knows the discrete log of h in base g. But this is really just a random string, so it can be coin flipped or uh, generated somehow. And then I'm going to use the notation x in a box to, say, to, to write a Pedersen commitment of x using randomness r. And then we have n parties, and every party has a share xi and a share ri of the value that is commitment, committed and of the randomness used in the commitment. Now, if you have two share commitments like this, it's actually really easy to compute addition of these values. So if you have a commitment of x and a commitment of y, and you want to compute a commitment of x plus y, It turns out that each party just needs to add their own shares locally. And this is really, uh, if you have to do a lot of addition, this means that additions basically come for free. In order to do multiplication, is a bit more tricky, because just multiplying your uh, local share is not going to work. But what we can do is that, assuming that we have a trusted guy that gives you a multiplicative triple, triple triplets, A, B, C, where C is the product of A times B. So this guy gives you just, gives to the people just random triplets of this form. Then you actually can compute a new multiplication of few times V, and the result is W, just by doing two openings and by uh, doing a linear combination of the, of the results. Clearly, if the we are back to square one, because it now if, if this guy is, is corrupted and he colludes with some of the parties in the, in the protocol, what he can do is that he can communicate A, B, and C to this guy. And given that here this, these values U minus A and U, V minus B are public, from these values and A and B, the corrupted guy can learn U, V, and W. So basically, the problem of uh, now all our problem is to replace this guy by a multi-party computation protocol that is going to do the same thing as this guy is doing, so giving out triplets of uh, multiplicative uh, commitments in a trusted way. Um, a note here, so uh, basically this, all these things can be preprocessed, and that's something that we like because this, uh, everything I, I told you so far, like if you have this trusted guy, then doing multi-party computation is really, really efficient. Doing addition is just uh, uh, doing some local additions. And doing multiplication is just opening two commitments. And this, this is quite nice, because then everything we are going to do and all the protocols that I'm going to describe from now on is not, uh, uh, doesn't depend on the function you want to compute or on, the, or, or on the input of the computation. So you can just have this guy computing these triplets uh, at so, uh, overnight and then share them to the, between the people. And then uh, in a week from now, we, we will compute something. And the, the actual online computation is going to be really efficient, while the offline, this preprocessing part is going to be slightly more involved. So let's see how to uh, actually do these random multiplications. We will start by taking any passive secure protocol for multiplication in ZP, where P is the order of this uh, group. So to be honest, when I say take any passive secure protocol, there aren't really that many candidates uh, out there. Uh, and most of them would, uh, would work using homomorphic encryption. There are also other solutions based on other assumptions, like uh, coding theory assumption and other. Uh, but this is what, given that we are actually going to implement this protocol, uh, that seemed to be the, the best solution for us. So 
And uh, we are going to look at Paleocrypto system, where there is an encryption uh, algorithm and an encryption algorithm. And the nice thing about Palier is that it is homomorphic, meaning that if you get two ciphertexts, an encryption of X and an encryption of Y, and you multiply them together, what you're going to get is an encryption of X plus Y modulo N. So here we have some kind of mismatching because the, uh, the modulo that we are working in the commitments is P, this is a prime number, while the modulo that we are working, that, that Palier crypto system works is N, is a big RSA uh, modulo, is the product of two large primes. So we're going to, we will need to do something about it. So I'm going to write an I for PI's public key. Everyone has his own uh, public key pair, pu public secret key pair. And I'm going to assume that the, the public key modulos are, ve are much bigger than the prime using the computation. This assumption actually makes sense uh, in the real world because um, as, the, as the group that we use to do the Pedersen commitment, we can use an elliptic curve uh, uh, group of points. And while um, and elliptic curves uh, cryptography, uh, given that we don't know how to break the discrete log in uh, sub-exponential time, that means that basically if you pick P to be a number of, uh, I don't know, 160 bits or 200 bits, you're going to have the same security uh, as the Palier crypto system for uh, an RSA module of size uh, 2,000 bits. So there is actually a big gap in the, in there, and we are going to use this gap as actually in a functional way during our protocol. So let's look at this simple semi-honest multiplication protocol. So we have one party that has its own shares A1 and B1. The other party has A2B2. And what they want to compute is C1 and C2, such that the sum of C1 and C2 is the product of A times B. So the first party can send an encryption of its own share under its own public key to the other party that can multiply B2 inside the ciphertext and then mask the result with some randomness. Then we can do the other thing, the other way around. And now the party can compute their own shares of C1 and C2. And then at the end, they can just commit to their shares and exchange the shares. I'm assuming here that the parties are semi-honest, meaning that they, that they follow the protocol as they are supposed to, and then they will try to learn some information from this protocol. But so the parties are always going to do what they are supposed to do here. So you can just let them commit and say, this is the, this is the result I'm committing to this one. Why is this protocol secure against a semi-honest adversary? Well, this part here just is an encryption of A1, and this encryption Palier is semantic secure, so it's not learning anything about A1. And what happens inside this multiplication is that, as, as I told you, I assume that N is much bigger than P, and therefore and I'm going to choose D in a, some big range. And therefore, when I compute A times B plus D modulo N, this is the same as an integer, uh, this is the same as integer computation. This number is small compared to n, so there is no modular reduction. The, so this is uh, really just a, uh, a small number plus a big number. And therefore, this result here is going to be statistically close to uh, uniform in uh, 0 p, p cube. So what this part sees when it decrypts this value is, doesn't depend on b, so it's not learning any information. That's perfect, but of course, uh, parties here can cheat they can send, when at the end of the protocol, they can send commitments to other values. It could be they could be choosing this A1 and B2 and D12, not in the range that they're supposed to be, uh, but in bigger range. So we need to force parties to behave in a semi-honest way. Of course, we could use zero-knowledge proofs, but uh, for it, that, that's a good uh, solution in theory, but not really in practice. Especially these range proofs, so if I'm, if I'm encrypting a value between 0 and P and I have to prove you that this uh, that, this is as, that what I encrypted is a small value, these range proofs are really, really expensive in practice. So instead of going for the zero-knowledge uh, approach, we're going to go for this efficient cut-and-choose approach that is um, inspired by this uh, previous work of us, that uh, LIGO for two-party secure computation, where we had uh, basically some, that's some re similar result to the one I'm presenting, but for Boolean uh, circuits. And the cost of this efficient cut and choose is going to be just a small constant uh, factor with respect to the semi ions protocol. So let's see how to do this. <laughs> so first of all, we let the parties generate a lot of these multiplicative triplets using the semi ions protocol, like one million of these triplets. 
And of course, in some of these uh, triplets, uh, the adversary might be choosing to cheat and learn some information. So when there is a skull here, it means that the adversary has some extra information or these triplets was generated done in a correct way. So the first step is we are going to check a bunch of these triplets in order to detect cheating. So we ask all the parties, we generate one million triplets, and then we, we coin flip a, a subset, a random string that defines a subset of this. And we just check that uh, everything, everyone reveals all the randomness they've been using during the protocol. And um, if everything matches, if, it, if every party was uh, behaving correctly, we, we accept and we proceed. If we detect some cheating, we just abort the protocol and we stop. Yep. You actually need a, need a coin flip? Or can, can you have each party choose its own set of, of samples to look at? We, like each says, show me these commitments. And, uh, uh, it depends. In the two-party case, it's enough if you just exchange randomness. If you are in parties, you have to do a small coin flip. Like, <laughs> the one party has to commit, then everyone else sends the randomness, and then you open a commitment. Otherwise, the last party could just bias the, the set towards his own. Uh, you do it uh, not really. Uh, yeah, we didn't think of it. It seems that one random more of, inter of interaction doesn't, uh, I mean, it's not worth making too many. Because each one of these, what really is killing the, the, the performance of this, or like what's really the, the bottleneck of this is generating these triplets, because that involves palier, uh, palier encryption, decryption, and those, this is the big thing. So what we really want to minimize is the number of uh, triplets that we generate. <coughs> so after we generated these triplets, we are going to randomly partition the remaining triplets that some of them are going to be correct, some of them are going to be uh, uh, maybe still uh, maliciously generated, and we're going to uh, partition them in small sets of size 2, 3, plus 1. And now we're going to combine them in order to, to distill uh, some good triplets from a bunch of uh, possibly uh, maliciously generated triplets. <coughs> in order to do this, uh, what we do really is that um, we go back to shamisic sharing. And we're going to, uh, in a way, um, I guess the the main idea is that we are going to do a Shamir secret, we are going to do a Shamir secret sharing reconstruction uh, over these triplets. So Shamir secret sharing uh, gives you privacy up, if, if up to some of the, up to a certain threshold of the shares are leaked. And that's what we are going to use. So we have a bunch of these commitments. Some of them are known to the adversary, but most of them are not. And then when you combine them together using Shamir secret sharing, what you actually get is uh, a bunch of uh, new commitments where the, the, the content is unknown to the adversary. In practice, this is just taking a linear combination of, this, uh, of these commitments. And now I'm going to show you why this works. So in Shamishic sharing, we, we start with two random polynomials, f of x and g of x, of degree uh, less or equal than t, such that uh, in f of 0 and in g of 0, we have, this, we have some secret u and some secret v. And then if you consider the product polynomial h of x equal to f of x times g of x, this is a new polynomial of degree 2t. Uh, and, uh, and this polynomial evaluated in 0 uh, contains the value u times b. So what we're going to do is we're going to generate a random bunch of uh, coefficients for the, poly for the first polynomial and for the second polynomial. trying to get to compute the product of the two original secrets. So we're going to defi de define these two uh, committed polynomials, uh, committed f of x and committed g of x, that, are actually, that actually everyone can uh, evaluate in uh, public, because uh, the unknown x is in the clear. So you can, when, when you get the coefficient of the ri's and u, you can evaluate f of x in any point. You can, you can get a commitment to the value of f of x in any point. And the same for g of x. <laughs> so 
So now what we want to do is that we, wanna, we have points over the polynomial f and points over the polynomial g, and we want to get points over the polynomial h, so that we can reconstruct h and reconstruct the, the product q times v. So we let all the parties evaluate the polynomial f and the polynomial g on 2t plus 1 points. And, uh, and for each one of these points, we are going to uh, do this multiplication using one of the original triplets that we computed before. OK? So now, this multi if this triplet was uh, generated correctly, was generated in a semi-honest way at the beginning, then this multiplication is secure. And the values f of i, g of i, and h of i will still be secret. If this triplet was generated in a malicious way, maybe the adversary knows a and b, then he will learn these two points. But our hope is that the adversary knows few of these points. So we learn few of these points that will not allow him to reconstruct uh, the secret h of 0. So after we do this multiplication, we have a bunch of points over the h polynomial, h of 1 to h of 2t plus 1. And that determines uh, the polynomial h of x of degree uh, less or equal than 2t. And given that we have 2t plus 1 points, we can reconstruct the uh, the value of this polynomial in 0, that is uh, u times v. And this is just a linear combination of the, 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 of the coefficients of these points. Any question? In BGW, what you do is this, you do this multiplication on, some, on the shares that we have. So in BGW, we have a bunch of uh, players. You assume that uh, a majority of those are honest. Then you do the, the multiplication. And given that the adversary knows less than d points of the, on the polynomial, it doesn't learn the secret. What we do here is in somehow different. We say we generate, instead of the, the parties in, G, in BGWs, correspond to our triplets. So when you generate the triplets, each one of these triplets is like a, a, a party in this BGW protocol that we run. <coughs> in a way, we are running BGW, uh, we are running like a two-layer protocol. So we have a um, protocol for dishonest majority, on, a protocol for honest majority on top of uh, another protocol for dishonest majority. OK, so why is this secure? Let's, let's play this game. So I put here in front of you uh, C buckets of C of size 2t plus 1. OK? And then I ask you uh, to prepare a box full of balls. We are going to put uh, green balls and red balls inside this box. I cannot see what's inside the box. The box is uh, sealed. And you can choose how many red balls and how many uh, green balls to put inside the box. So green balls are. Uh, uh, triplets where you didn't cheat, and red balls are triplets where you cheated. Now I put a hand in the, in, the, in the box, and I start extracting balls. And if I see a red one, you lose. That is the check that you were doing at the beginning. We open half of the triplets. If I see that you cheated, you, you lost the game. You are the adversary, of course. <laughs> and um, if I don't see any red ball, we go to the second phase of the game. In the, in the second phase of the game, I open the box, and I start putting uh, balls at random from the box inside the buckets. So the first ball goes there, the second ball goes here, the third ball goes there, and so on. <coughs> at the end of the game, you win if you didn't lose before, and if any of these buckets has a majority of red balls. So. If you play this game now, how many red balls would you put in the box? What's your optimal strategy to uh, to win this game. Um, this is an exercise, and more or less, the best strategy is to put something like 1.5 times the size of the bucket. So we can bound the probability the adversary is going to win our game. Uh, and the probability the adversary is going to win is, uh, so is less than 1 over uh, the number of buckets I put there uh, raised to the size of the buckets. <coughs> and we can make this. Uh, uh, small as we want. The nice thing here is that uh, we get security not just by the size of the buckets, 
but also from the number of the buckets. That means that this approach, uh, our approach, works better if you compute bigger functionalities. So if you want to do 1 million uh, multiplication instead of 100 multiplication, the replication factor is going to be smaller and smaller. The more multiplication you do, the, the more complex the computation you are performing, the more efficient it gets. And that is nice because usually these arithmetic circuits are quite big uh, when you turn, uh, you know, like real, um, like real life problems into arithmetic circuits, they get big. And so it's actually it's a nice feature. So this is uh, what I showed you so far is how to get one good, one, one good triplets out of uh, a bunch of triplets. Actually, if instead of using Shamir secret sharing, we use the uh, PEC Shamir secret sharing, so where instead of embedding one secret inside a polynomial, we embed a bunch of secrets inside the polynomial, then we can get uh, these numbers to be much better. So instead of distilling one good triplets from one set, we distill uh, a constant factor, like one fourth of uh, good triplets out of each set. So I level overview of the proof. So show you the bell game. <laughs> from the ball game, we know that uh, if I don't when when we start we open we check half of the triplets if you didn't if i didn't see any good any bad uh, triplets there it means that there are few bad triplets if you go to the second stage of the game it means that you didn't put too many otherwise if you put a lot of uh, if you misbehave too if you misbehave too often i'm going to catch you with high probability if you misbehave just a uh, few times there are going to be few uh, uh, bad triplets that are going to uh, so we are going to have less than t bad triplets per, per set and that means that the adversary knows less than t points on each polynomial. And that means that he has no information on uv and uv from Shamir secret sharing. There is one extra step that you have to take to get uh, to achieve UC security. Uh, so one, one of the security requirements for uh, UC intuitively is that parties have to prove that they know their inputs. This has to do with, uh, <laughs> with non-malleability. This has to do with the fact that you want to be sure that uh, if, uh, if a party is playing uh, with, uh, on more protocols at the same time, you cannot get some information from one protocol, like some ciphertext from one protocol and forward, forward it to the other protocol. So every time they input something, they have to prove that they know actually those values. Um, and so, so what we do, again, instead of giving proof of knowledge of these values, um, we basically pre-process knowledge by uh, generating uh, some random UC Pedersen commitment. I'm going to tell you now what those are. And ask people to open differences between these random uh, uh, UC commitments and the Pedersen commitment that we use during the protocol. So basically, <laughs> uh, PI is going to generate some uh, UC commitment R. And, a UC, and, and by generating this UC commitment, it's going to prove that he knows R. And then when he wants to input uh, a value A, he just opens the difference between this should be R or, should, should, or this should be X. X. You choose which one. So it's going to open the difference between this random commitment and the, the actual value. And opening this difference is, is, is a proof of knowledge of the fact that he knows the, the value is, in, is actually giving us an input to the protocol. So how do we generate this UC Pedersen commitment uh, that can be used together with the standard Pedersen commitment. <coughs> so we start again from a semi-honest UC commitment. Uh, we, look at, we assume that there is a common reference string in the sky that contains uh, four group elements. And the UC commitment of X with randomness R and S is going to be of this form. This is basically an Elgamal encryption in the first two uh, places. And then there is a Pedersen commitment down here. When when you want to open one of these commitments, you're going to send the value x and s. So r, the value used during the Elgamal encryption, is, never, uh, is actually never revealed. So the sender sends this value, and the receiver checks that uh, this component is consistent with this uh, opening. So why do we have this first part if we never use it? Because when we go and do the security proof, what happens is that the simulator is going to uh, choose the common reference string. And therefore, he knows the uh, trapdoor 
So the discrete log of G2 in base G1 and G4 in base G3. <coughs> so using the first trapdoor, the simulator can extract uh, X from this first part. And using the second trapdoor, the simulator can open uh, the commitment to any value of its choice. And basically, extracting, and extracting a commitment and equivocating a commitment are the two security requirements for UC commitments. Again, this works just if the parties are semi-honest, because if the party is uh, uh, malicious, it can put x here and some other value here, right? So what we're going to do is just to reapply the same uh, uh, idea from before. So we're going to have the sender generate uh, a lot of random commitments, x size, you see uh, commitment x1 to you see commitment xn. And then you're going to open half of those commitments and check that those are consistent. And again, we are going to randomly partition these commitments, combine them together, and distill some good uh, commitments from some uh, possibly bad commitments. <coughs> so uh, basically, what I told you is uh, this LIGO approach from uh, this, this technique that we use in both for the triplets and for the commitment is this LIGO approach that uh, we used also in this previous paper. And this approach can be uh, thought as you produce a lot of bricks, then you check some of them to see that they are good, and then you combine these, uh, these other bricks in order to get an object that, uh, that works even if some of the bricks uh, are not good. As a result, we get security against active adversary in an efficient way and with this preprocessing flavor where you can actually preprocess all these expensive, uh, uh, all the redundancy, all these expensive uh, replication factors can be pushed at the beginning of the protocol. And, um, and then when you have the online uh, protocol, this is going to be as secure as the semi-honest protocol, basically. Application of this approach so far have been in the two-party com computation case uh, for Boolean circuits, MPC for arithmetic circuits that I told you now, the UC commitments as a building block of this, um, uh, of this protocol. And hopefully, I hope that this approach, would, uh, this, this kind of efficient cut and choose might find new application in also other uh, scenarios. And I guess that's it. Okay, any questions? So I'm a little skeptical of your claim of the slowness of, of zero knowledge proofs. Have you <coughs> done any comparisons, say, with with GS proofs or things that might actually be able to prove some of the things you're trying to prove? Uh, the problem with GS proof is that, for instance, to do the multiplication, okay, you start. You need to start with the palier. Can you do GS proof on for, for Palier? That they, they would, right? Well, you could if you use a large enough, right? if you, if, I guess if you had a large enough, because uh, you, no, you still have to prove, right? But I guess the real answer is no, we didn't compare. But we just thought that, you know, uh, having this Palier thing in between would just break all the, all, all the proofs that I knew of. But any suggestion would be sure. highly appreciated. Yeah. That doesn't. Maybe we just we have just chosen the wrong statement to prove. <laughs> there are two ways of looking at it, right? Either there are no efficient proofs for our statement, or we have chosen the wrong statements. But it seems that uh, the the basic steps, so doing the multiplication and proving that the multiplication has been done correctly, uh, I don't know how to do that. You know. Also, because we don't want to bring the encryptions uh, online. So there are efficient proofs for Palier. Okay? The thing is that Palier encryption, <coughs> so we have uh, Palier in the preprocessing phase. And then in the online phase, we just have uh, commitments, Pedersen commitments in an, on an elliptic curve. And there is a huge gap between the efficiency of uh, Pedersen commitment in an elliptic curve and Palier encryption decryption. I don't remember the numbers, but you know, it's like one ta order of 1,000 or stuff like that. Do you have an implementation of this that's running? Uh, yeah, they are, yeah, we are, they're actually, so this work is under submission and there is also another work that is the implementation and that, uh, that is also under submission. Okay. So, it's, so it's efficient in other words enough to actually compute like what? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the benchmark application was these auctions, the same auctions as we used in the uh, VIF case.
Thank you.